Wow. Well, the discussion came, of course, very acute because these uh, 16 pediatricians in Belgium have written this open letter into the press that, that we need urgently a law for euthanasia in children, uh, a letter of which I was really surprised because in my daily practice in pediatric neuro-oncology I never have felt such a need, so maybe I missed something, uh, but um, having done a little questionnaire to my network in pediatric neuro-oncology and in my network for um, histiocyte society, most of the people said in their country there was in fact no need, there was no demand, nor in the general uh, community, nor in the pediatric community. Um, although some countries uh, said that people were thinking that maybe a law should be developed, that it maybe is a small proportion of people who think there is a need. But whatsoever, we have now this law uh, where children without age limit to the lower side can request for euthanasia if they have uh, the competence, so they should um, request themselves um, for euthanasia, they should have the full capacity to understand what this request means, they should ask it to somebody else who then uh, performs the act and there should be some assessment by um, external uh, people that in fact this capacity is there available so that the child really knows about what <coughs> the child speaks and in looking to what is happening and even without expressing an own opinion um, I started to ask questions um, that should be answered of course before uh, one can proceed with the discussion and uh, there are questions at several levels. Uh, for instance, how will we exclude an impulsivity in asking a question? We know that the frontal lobe, the emotional control over the more primitive decision-making processes um, is only full present after the age of 20 and you see also in daily life uh, that people assess uh, the risk taking of youngsters uh, only normalized after the age of 20 look to the insurance companies for driving cars so how will we handle with this problem if we come into questions by a 13 14 year old um, adolescent who is in a stressful, sometimes painful situation, there to this question there is no answer, so impulsivity. The second question that I have is the um, influence from the surrounding, from the parents, from the further family, from care providers, um, and that can be very subtle, but it becomes dangerous if there are signs from the surrounding that in fact the surrounding finds this ill child too big burden for them if there is a, and a child can feel that even without words and if such an influence is there the child might be forced a little bit without explicitly forced but still might be forced to ask for such a question and then of course it's not an autonomous question anymore it's an influenced question and there I see no tools how people will have control over that uh, when they are as an external um, advisor to say yes or no to such a question and I have a lot of problems um, that are not answered yet. Mm -hmm. And then a third um, very major element is the way of objectivity in assessment. So we know uh, nowadays um, that we have to ask informed consent to children for um, participating in clinical trials. But there is in fact no objective tool 
today available that really can help you to say this child has the full competence or capacity to give with full understanding informed consent. Even if an external neuropsychologist of pediatric psychiatrist comes into the story to give this objective assessment, it's not possible. It's simply mm. not possible. And even in the written comment to the law, a pediatric psychiatrist has said that it is in fact not possible. So if we fail there, any objectivity, then it remains in a subjective feeling which might be manipulated in both directions by all people involved, the patient, the parents, the surrounding, the treating physicians even can influence in this process. Having said that, it means that the autonomy of the child in asking such a question might become in danger. Mm -hmm. So to my view, the current law does not give the appropriate answers to very, very, very important questions and is, in my view, premature. Right. Well, the law for the children is, is still very young, of course, and in daily life I have not yet seen any change, but I can imagine, um, as I have said also during my talk, the freedom induces pressure to use the freedom. So if people now have the freedom to ask for euthanasia, they might start feeling the pressure to ask the question for euthanasia. So it might well be that in the next years some children will ask that question because they have the right to ask that question. Maybe some parents will influence their child to help in asking that question, which would of course be very contradictory to the autonomy of this question. Um, so it might change, but till now uh, it's, it's too young and in daily practice it has not changed today a lot. And even I think how we do pediatric oncology, we are very close with the family. This is really um, a triangle uh, communication, parents, family, patient, and medical care providers. I even don't think that, that uh, it will change. Parents usually in the first place want that their child lives mm -hmm. and has a good quality of life. And then of course you start up with building up this relationship and as usually, if we don't see that cure is possible, we make a slow stepwise um, change towards another accent in uh, care, not any more cure, but symptom relief. I've also said in the lecture that the palliative treatment teams are from the university hospitals themselves. So in our organization, it are the same doctors that fight for cure mm -hmm. and that at another at a certain way go more to symptom control. So this abrupt change for euthanasia is not scheduled in the normal daily practice. So I think maybe it will not change even in future, but we will see the law is very young.